And welcome, friends, to this edition of the Grace Hour. We're broadcasting live here from our studios, which are located at the home of the Greater Grace World Outreach in Baltimore, Maryland. Well, welcome, friends, not only to today's broadcast, but to a brand new week of broadcasting live right here on the Grace Hour. And, of course, if you've been listening for some time, you know that each week brings a new theme. And this week's theme is having a healthy identity and what it means to live and to live as Christ. So we hope that you'll stay with us for the next hour and join us, of course, when the phone lines are open. We invite you to participate in the broadcast uh, each and every day that we broadcast live here from our studios. And it's quite simple. You get to a phone, you dial one of these numbers, and join us on the broadcast and share your thoughts with us. Or perhaps it's a question, a comment, a testimony, Uh, counseling need that we could assist you with, and your prayer requests are always welcome here in our broadcast. Here are the telephone numbers for you to join us at 800-338-7060 is the toll-free number in all of North America, and we invite you to dial that number when the phone lines are open uh, anywhere in North America, Canada, and the continental United States. Also, if you're listening locally in the Baltimore area, the local telephone number for you to join us is 410-483-3700. And we want to welcome everyone listening live at gracehour.org, YouTube Live, Facebook Live. And, of course, our podcast is broadcast on a number of platforms such as Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Audible, Stitcher, just to name a few. And, again, we want to welcome all of you that are tuning in to our live broadcast on this Monday morning edition of the Grace Hour. Uh, So great to be with you. We want to also mention that if you can't reach us by phone and you'd like to send us an email, uh, which still many of you do from time to time, you can email us. Our address is questions at gracehour.org. Again, that's the email address here at the Grace Hour, questions at gracehour.org. And we're excited, friends, about this new theme this week. Um, This is something that all believers um, either have experienced in some measure to some degree or have fully and completely understood their identity in Christ, but still some struggle with their personal identity. And I think it's important that we talk about it and develop this theme throughout the week. And joining us in the studio today, Pastor Matt Garrett, and he is the director of our Bible college here, Maryland Bible College and Seminary, and I mention that because, well, we have a new semester coming up very, very soon. I believe at the end of August, things get started, and then we'll be into the fall semester here of 2022, and some of you listening may be interested in joining us for our Bible College semester. Well, if that is the case, we'll we'll give you a telephone number a little later in the broadcast, a way in which you can reach those here in the offices of Maryland Bible College and Seminary, but we're looking forward to a great semester and looking forward to a great program this morning on this, the Monday morning edition of the Grace Hour. Pastor Matt, welcome. Thanks, Pastor Love. Always a pleasure to be here. Uh, anyone who is interested in Bible College, you can visit us at mbcs.edu. You can give us a call at 410-488-2606, and uh, we can take your calls during the day. 12 and 4, summer hours, um, please give us a call. If you are interested in any way, our first week every semester is free to any new visitors. Uh, August 26th is the kickoff night. It's a Friday. And then the following Monday, August 29th through maybe September 2nd or 3rd is the first week. That is free to attend. If you are thinking about it, please come out. You can apply to our college online at mbcs.edu or you can stop by our office and visit us in person. Uh, So yeah, we're going to talk about what it means specifically, uh, the phrase, a child of God today. And so let's just pray and uh, ask God for his wisdom and guidance as we we cover that topic today. Uh, Jesus, we are so thankful uh, to be able to be here and doing this, Lord, to be able to, to preach your word, to be able to give utterance that you have given us. We just ask that you speak to us today, Lord, through your word, that you touch our hearts, that you uh, build us up in our identity, that we can be secure 
knowing exactly who we are because of what you say about us and because of what you say about who we are. Not anyone else, not anything else, Lord, but what you say about us. Jesus, bless these words and this short program. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the text uh, in question today, I'm going to start in John chapter 1. I will read you verses 6 through 14 just to have like a whole a whole thought here. But we're really focusing on verses 12 and 13. 12 and 13. And you'll see the phrase sons of God or maybe in a different version, uh, child of God in verse 12. So in John chapter 1 and verse 6 it says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Not, not the writer of this epistle, John the Baptist. Uh, the same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lights every man that comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, so what is this phrase? Uh, in, in the King James, it's <clears throat> sons of God, but we're talking about a child of God, a child of God in general. Who are the children of God? You've got to ask yourself this question sometimes when you read, or you, ha- you just have to pose yourself questions as you're reading through your Bible sometimes to make sure that you are following along, that you are understanding what's being presented to you. This is a super uh, easy thing to do to help you as you read your Bible. So I'm going to ask you the question, and we should all ask this to ourselves, who are the children of God. Well, in John chapter 1 and verse 12, it really kind of lays it out for us. If it can be said simply, it's right there in verse 12. It's them, the very end of the verse, them that believe on his name. At the beginning of the verse, it says, as many as received him. So who are the children of God? What makes a child of God? It is the person who believes on whose name? The name of Jesus Christ. The name that Peter exclaims in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 is the only name under heaven and on earth which men can call out to be saved by. The only name is Jesus Christ. Those that receive him, those that believe on his name. How? How, how, do, we, how do we call on him? How do we, do we receive him? Another verse is Romans chapter 8 verse 14. We'll get to that in a second. The how. Romans 8, verse 14, For as many are, as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Okay, those that believe on Christ's name, those that are led by the Spirit of God, these are the children, children of God. So we kind of answer the how in the first verse. We kind of answer how you become a child of God with that word believe. That word believe <clears throat> is extremely important. It says it in Galatians chapter 3. In verse 26, hopefully I can turn there quickly, avoid those awkward radio silences. Galatians chapter 3, 26, when I can't turn there quickly, I just keep talking to, to satisfy your ears. Galatians 3, 26, for you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, so that word believe in John 1, 12, and that word faith in Galatians 3, 26, very similar words. In the Greek, very similar understanding. How do you become a child of God? You apply faith. You believe. You make a choice. In John chapter 3, verse 16, sometimes referred to as the gospel in one verse, John chapter 3, verse 16, this is the how. This is applying faith. This is believing. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever does what? Believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So who are the children of God? Those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, the only begotten of the Father. Not any other name in heaven can be preached <clears throat> or named that you can call out and be saved by other than Jesus Christ. Why? What did he do? What has he come to do? He came, he lived a perfect life, he was born of a virgin, he 
uh, stepped out of his throne in Philippians chapter 2, put on the likeness of man, took upon all of our sins, 1 John chapter 2, Isaiah 53, took upon the iniquity of us all and died a sinner's death for us. When he was raised by the Spirit of God, resurrected on the third day, and then later ascended into heaven, he took his rightful place at the throne in which we can also be with him, part of his body, when we believe, when we apply faith, when we choose Christ over our own ways, when we choose his, his salvation rather than our own works. That's who a children of God is, the person who has put their faith in Jesus Christ. I don't mean to belabor it, but I think it's a really important thing that we say sometimes. Uh, okay, so what does it mean to be a child of God? What does it mean to be a child of God? Well, in John chapter 3, Jesus is talking to a man named Nicodemus. He is a Pharisee. He is uh, very well versed in the scriptures. And in John chapter 3 and verse 5, it says this, what does it mean to be a child of God? Verily, verily, Jesus says, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He says you must be born of the Spirit. What does it mean to be a child of God? It means you are born of the Spirit. Pastor Justin preached a message last night in our church, the evening service. He gave this really great example. He said, you have a balloon that's just filled with air, and after a while it deflates, gravity gets the best of it. But if you have a balloon that's filled with helium, it's born of another element. It's born of something else, and that helium defies gravity. That helium goes up into the air that drives the balloon up into the air. It's like us being born of the Spirit. We are, we are born of a whole new nature through Jesus Christ, through our faith in Him, through our belief in Him. And we defy the natural man. We go against the natural man. We're born of the Spirit. What else does it mean to be a child of God? You are born of the Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, it says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit in whom you were sealed by. It means that you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. It means that there is nothing in John chapter 10 that can take you out of the Father's hand. If you are a child of God, nothing can remove you from the grip of the Father on your life. Nothing. You are sealed by the Spirit. You think in 1 John 2.20, it talks about the anointing. It gives this picture of oil being poured down. You think of the way oil cover skin. Do you know what it does to the pores of your skin if you have oil on you? It seals the pores of your skin. This is the Holy Spirit sealing the believer unto the day of redemption, Ephesians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14. Sealing the believer unto the day of redemption, okay, until Christ comes to take you up, until you are, uh, you leave this body and are taken uh, to heavenly places to sit with Christ in Ephesians chapter 2. Okay, what does it mean to be a child of God? You are born of the Spirit. You are sealed by the Spirit in Galatians chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. This is really interesting. This is kind of like the opposite of being a child of God and part of it. Okay, this is kind of like a little Galatians 4, verses 5 through 7. It says, Paul is speaking, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, okay, what does it mean to be a child of God? It means, verse 7, that you are no more a servant of the law or sin or the devil. Okay, you are no more a servant, but you are a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Also in Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 16, you have the, the Spirit of God in your heart allowing you to cry out, Abba, Father. He is your Father. There is no one else other than God who is now your Father. And then finally, what, is it, what does it mean to be a child of God? John chapter 8, verse 44, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, it means that you are no longer a child of the devil. It means you are no longer an enemy of God in Romans chapter 5. You are beloved of your Father in heaven who sent his Son to die for you. That's what it means to be a child of God. So we have these thoughts. We're forming this idea of a child of God. 
I feel like it wouldn't be right unless we talked about also the practical benefits of being a child of God in your life. And I have a few for you. If, if, you, have, if you have the capacity, here's a few benefits of being a child of God. This should, this should lift all of us up. This should give us like a real bump for our day today. I found, I found rest being a child of God. And look at these different ways, different scenarios we can find rest in as a child of God. The first benefit being a child of God is rest. Uh, rest from what? Rest from so many different aspects of our life. How about in Matthew chapter 8, we have rest from fear. If you look at verses 23 through 27, the disciples hop into a boat with Christ and the storms start, the storm starts raging. Uh, wind, waves, the disciples are scared out of their minds. Pastor Love, what do you think the number one fear is of society in general? As like top of the list, what's everyone ultimately afraid of in the world today? I would say death. Absolutely. It's death. I really put Pastor Love on the spot there. He was, <laughs> he was ready to go. Uh, it's death. Absolutely. These guys are in a boat. The storm is raging. The waves are coming at them. Do you know what Christ is doing in the middle of this storm? He's asleep on the end of the boat. He's asleep on the end of the boat. Whenever the disciples wake him up, he just <clears throat> calms the storm. He speaks and the storm is calm. When we are in Christ, when we are a child of God, when we have believed and applied faith in who he is, we don't have this fear of death anymore. We, don't have, we have rest from fear. We have rest from fear. What else do we have rest from? <clears throat> Matthew chapter 11, uh, the, let's see, the proverbial mouse wheel of life working, the curse in Genesis chapter 3 that God put on man. Work, tire, uh, being tired, weary. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. We have rest from that. Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest under your souls. This rest goes so deep when you are a child of God that the soul that is <clears throat> cast down in Psalm 42, the soul that is like beyond weary, finds rest in being a child of God with Christ. And Christ says, For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Uh, and then in Matthew chapter 6, we found, found all these examples of rest in the book of Matthew, Gospel of Matthew. Uh, uh, Matthew, the one who was a publican, the one who was working hard all of his life, uh, going against the grain of society, going against his own culture to be a tax collector. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, we have rest from worry, from anxiety, from wondering where our provision is going to come from. Do we still think about it? Do we still worry about it? Yeah, we do. But what can we do knowing that we are a child of God? We can seek first in Matthew 6, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and know, trust, believe, have faith that all these things will be added unto us. We have nothing to worry about. Uh, let's see, another benefit of being a child of God, wisdom. Wisdom in James chapter 1, verse 5 uh, the epistle writer, James, half-brother of Christ, he exhorts us that if any man lack wisdom, if, if you lack wisdom for any situation in your life, this can be applied to any situation in your life. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and abrades not. He doesn't hold it back. If you're coming to God and asking him for wisdom, for your dilemma, for your current situation, for the sin in your life, for the thing that is just uh, becoming the most important part of your life, if you ask him for wisdom in that, it says he is not going to hold back. He upbraids not, and it shall be given to the man who asks. And we're reminded of God's character and nature in James chapter 1, verse 17, where it says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Every time you ask for wisdom, it may not be the wisdom that you think it should be, but God will give you wisdom from above, which is first pure, then peaceable. Uh, James chapter 3, wisdom from above. 
and he will give it to you to apply directly to your situation. Maybe it's to go in another direction from what other people are going in. Maybe there's a mob of people around you saying, we should do this thing, and you're the only one asking God what we should do, and he tells you to go a different direction, and he saves you from a terrible situation. Maybe it's just to be inspired, to be able to do something, to be able to uh, do something for his kingdom. It says sometimes when we ask in James chapter 4, we ask according to our lust, we ask amiss. But when we ask according to God's heart, he is there, he is ready to provide. A huge benefit, huge benefit of being a child of God. Humongous, amazing benefit of being a child of God. We are free from sin. Romans chapter 6, we are free from sin. In Romans 6 and verse 3 says, Do you not know that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And then skip down to verse 7. It says, He that is dead is freed from sin. We are free from sin. Again, in verse 14, it says, Sin shall not have dominion over you. You are not under the law, but you are under grace. In Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, although we have the natural law, although we're the balloon that eventually is brought down by gravity as a natural man, when we take on the Spirit of God, when we take on the new man, when we are filled with the Spirit in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, we have a new law working in our hearts and minds. In uh, Romans 8, verses 1 and 2, it says, There's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Uh, wow. We are free from sin. We are free from the law. We have a new nature. These are amazing benefits of being a child of God. Maybe I'll just end with this quick thought of this conversation that, that Christ has with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Now here's a man who was born into the Jewish nation. Uh, he was raised to become a Pharisee. He became a Pharisee. He was a leader of the Pharisees. Okay, He's asking Christ what it means essentially to be a child of God. Have you ever met that person who says, oh, yeah, 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 I'm a Christian. Yeah, I, I, I was raised in a Christian family. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, 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 I, be, I believe in God. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Okay, if anyone could say that, Nicodemus could say that, right? But what does he do when he meets Christ? He is so torn by who Christ is and what he's saying and what he's teaching that he has to ask him. So we see uh, in verse 3, Jesus is speaking to him and he answers the first thing he says unto Nicodemus, verily, verily, like pay attention to this answer, Nicodemus. This is the most important thing I could say to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, you may have been taught to walk a Christian life. You may have been taught to live in a Christian manner. Uh, but I got to ask you one question. Do you have the Spirit of God living inside of you? Are you led by the Spirit of God? Did you ever put faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Have you ever put faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? If you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, you must be born again. You were born into Christianity. You were born of water. You were born of your mother and father. You were raised in a home, a Christian home, but you were never able to be put to the decision, I need to believe in Jesus Christ. We're giving you that opportunity today. It's an awesome opportunity. It'll change your life forever. You've got some of the benefits uh, that we talked about today. If you make that decision, just simply ask Christ to come into your heart. Say, Jesus, save me. I am a sinner, and I need your salvation to free me. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Well, you're listening live to the Grace Hour, friends, on this Monday morning edition of our broadcast. That wraps up today's devotional message. And, of course, if you did indeed receive Christ as your Savior, accepted that invitation uh, to ask him to come into your heart, we want to hear from you. Please contact us here at the Grace Hour at one of these numbers, 800-338-7060. And the local number in Baltimore, 410-483-3700. Let us know you made that decision, and we can celebrate your new birth. And, of course, each one of us did have a physical birthday that we relate (laughs) to, and now you can add to that a spiritual birthday as well. Well, friends, the phone lines are open. Here's a great opportunity for you to join us. Uh, We'll give you the numbers now and throughout the broadcast, so if you're thinking about joining us, please don't hesitate. 800-338-7060. That's toll free in all of North America. And right here in the Baltimore area, you can join us, friends, at 410-483-3700. And Tess has written to us from Malmo, Sweden, says, praise God. Uh, Thanks, pastors, for the great message that gives us cheerful encouragement always. Amen. And our dear friend, Vladimir Davitsky in the Ukraine says, praise the Lord, hugs and love from Ukraine. And friends, keep all of our people that are in that country, the country of Ukraine, in your prayers. Uh, sometimes I think we can forget that that conflict still goes on, impacting mm-hmm. hundreds and thousands of lives, actually millions that have fled the country, families that have been broken up, husbands, fathers, grandfathers who Uh, They've lost their lives in this conflict. So just pray for a quick resolution, protection for all the saints in that country, and uh, just prayers for the Ukrainians. They're on our hearts all the time. Thinking of you, Vladimir, and your family as well. Ilhan sends his greetings. And Nestor, our good friend right here in Baltimore, says, Good morning, men of God from Catonsville. I'm excited to hear the messages this week on the Grace Hour on this great subject of healthy identity. You know, Pastor Matt, one of the best definitions, concise, precise definitions I've ever heard for identity is a, it's a conscious sense of individual uniqueness. Hmm. In other words, we are conscious of who we are. We, we sense that, and that consciousness of who we are, is it's, it belongs to us. It doesn't belong to somebody else. The great thing about being a born-again believer is that, it, in essence, it's your relationship with God. It's not somebody else's relationship with God. It's not you imitating somebody else's relationship with God. It's that individual, unique, conscious fellowship that you have with a living God. And that is, well, you mentioned it in your devotional message. John tells us... Uh, the, the uh, apostle tells us the reason why he wrote his gospel. In the 20th chapter, the 31st verse, he says, These things I have written that you might believe hmm. that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So there's a pretty clear-cut reason as wow. to why John wrote the gospel, so that you might believe on the Son of God, and that believing you might have life. His epistle, on the other hand, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, hmm. he says, <laughs> These things I have written unto you that have believed on the name of the Lord Jesus, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. Wow. So the gospel was written so that you might have life. The epistle was written so that you might know that you have that life. And I think we could also include in that that you might know who you really are as a child of God, because I think that this, this whole I- identity business is so crucial to the believer because without a sense of identity, what can we really go after? What, what can we really accomplish in life? You know, I remember as sure. a young person, my parents, I, I could sense the pressure as I was getting ready to graduate from high school. You know, uh, they kept telling me about my older sister. She's, <laughs> she's in, nursing school she's gone to college she's getting her education she's going to be something Uh (laughs) and essentially what they were saying to me is what about you right (laughs) what about your future 
And I, I can I can recall thinking to myself, my future is, you know, this might have been a Wednesday afternoon that we had this conversation. I'm thinking my future is Friday night. That's right. That's as far into the future as I could see. That's what we were looking for. Exactly. To. Yeah. And so I I didn't have any plans. I didn't have any purpose. I didn't have any goals or objectives because I didn't know who I was. How can you achieve those goals and objectives? How can you have any real purpose yeah. if you don't begin with an identity? Right, yeah. Uh, there's a similar similar thought in Proverbs. It says, where there is no vision, uh, the people perish. And it's, it's the same idea for you as an individual in your own life. Uh, where do you see yourself going? What do you see yourself doing? If you don't have any sort of plan, like uh, I, th- I think of going into college, how many, how many students go into college with an undecided major? And it's, it's one of those things where like, oh, you'll figure it out along the way. Oh, you, you know, you'll, you'll get it, but, but what if you don't? What happens when you don't get it? And then you just make a decision and you're stuck with something for maybe 25, 30 years of your life, maybe, maybe longer, maybe less. I don't know what happens. Uh, but when you make a decision to follow after Christ, when you make a decision to, to look to Jesus, there's like a whole different realm of your life that opens up. There's a whole different way that you can go about your life and it, and it all start all these other decisions that you used to think were so important start to like kind of whittle away as you start to see more clearly like what your walk with Christ is going to be like and you're just receiving constantly you did nothing to be saved you you made a choice you believed you applied faith right you do nothing to be uh sanctified you do nothing to be glorified it's all in God's hands from from that point forward but you still do have a focus you're focusing on Christ you're focusing on uh, Peter Peter puts it as Second Peter chapter three. You're focusing on growing in grace and knowledge. You're focusing on receiving. You're walking according to the way that you've been taught. Paul says, uh, "Yeah, having having just having just a simple, uh, you know, one little thing can really can really change your life in a positive, w- get you some positive momentum." Yeah. Yeah. No question about it. And then you can begin to tackle some of the goals and objectives that you're looking at in life. But you know, think of how many times in the Scripture we read about this question asked by those that God was speaking to, calling or preparing for ministry. Who am I? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's an identity question. When God spoke to Moses sure. in Exodus chapter 3, that was his question. Mm-hmm. Who am I? In other words, you mentioned earlier in your thoughts that, you know, an identity and having an identity in Christ is what develops security. Well, obviously, Moses is a very insecure individual. And I love the fact that he asked that question, God, who am I? And God never responded by saying, well, well you're Moses. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. you, were, you were snatched up out of the rivers in Egypt. You were raised by Pharaoh's daughter. You've got an Egyptian education. You understand the nature of the Egyptian. And you've been out here in the desert for 40 years, so who better to bring my people through the wilderness than somebody that's lived there? For the pe- he didn't say any of that. He Nothing actually answered him. his question, which was, who am I, by telling Moses, I am that I, I am. am. Which is to say or suggest that our identity is so wrapped up in who God is that unless we get to know him, we're never going to really know ourselves. Mm-hmm. We got a caller. Let's take Suzette. She's joining us right here from the Baltimore area. Suzette, welcome to the Grace Hour. Go right ahead. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to just really just give praise and glory, honor to God. I'm just so thankful for that message that you shared, Pastor Matt. And I'm enjoying the, the last portion you were talking about how without a vision, the people perish. And um, I looked up the word perish one time. It means flounder. And that's that's what happens, yeah. and it can happen, you know, right? Oh yeah, a flounder like like a flounder, flip flop, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. like a fish out of water. But the grace of God, when when we purpose to bring our thoughts, you know, take them captive and bring them obedience to who you know the Lord says that we are. And um, I'm just so grateful for the Grace Hour, grateful for every Bible college class, grateful for every message, and just so appreciative. And um, 
also, um, I just got out of the hospital out of being, you know, being over at Bayview for a few days, which was a brand new experience, you know. But God was just faithful in each, each moment that I was there, and he gave me opportunities to talk to people about wow. the Lord. It was such a blessing. One of the doctors even was, you know, born again and saved. And, you know, we picked up on each other's spirit as we were talking. And so I asked him, do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? And he said, yes. I said, you're born again? He said, yes. And I was so grateful for that. And then there were other opportunities to talk to people about the Lord freshly who didn't know who he was. And there were some that were open, and there were some you could even sense. And it's like they didn't have a capacity to even hear that, you know. Mm -hmm. But God was faithful, and I'm just grateful for every step that he takes me through. And thank you all for your love and your prayers. Uh, You're welcome, Suzette. Thank you for calling and and making a, a great contribution to the broadcast today. We really appreciate it. Hey, love you, Pilo. God bless you. The phone lines are open, as Suzette can witness to, 800-338-7060. That's toll free in all of North America and locally here in Baltimore, 410-483-3700. Pastor Matt, it's so important, isn't it, that um, you cannot allow what you do to determine your identity. So many people do. Um, I can vividly remember that night we had a chapel service with our NBA players and they all came in and it was the theme, the subject that night was identity. Mm-hmm. And I asked them, I literally asked them, went right down the line and said, what is it? I, no, I asked the question, who <laughs> are you? Yeah. And each one of them said, I'm a basketball player. Yep. I mean, the first one said it and I think the others thought, well, that's a good answer, so I'll do it too. <laughs> and I, at the end, I had to say, you all got the question wrong because yes. every one of you told me what you do not one of you told me who you are yeah i said your identity uh, is found in christ it's not found in what you do because for many of us for all of us in fact if we live long enough we're not going to be able to do what we once did yep. does that mean we no longer have an identity mm-hmm. i mean that's that's a crucial question to right. ask yeah i mean the the biggest difference okay yeah okay you're an engineer for however many years of your life you are uh, you know, any sort of professional athlete, uh, you are, you know, you have this thing going for you your entire life. At some point it stops, right? At some point it stops. What doesn't stop is when you believe in Jesus Christ, you are never like, you are never going to be anything other than a child of God. That is going to be your identity from that point, the, the point in time when you make the decision through the rest of eternity. It doesn't, it doesn't ever change. When you have a solid foundation like that, uh, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul talks about not building on any other foundation than that which has already been laid. Then you can really start to build yourself up in who you are in Christ. Then you can really start to encourage yourself and tell yourself that, like Suzette was just telling us, like regardless of the situation she was just in, she was so blessed to see God's faithfulness and to be able to share, uh, you know, who Christ is with different people. And that was what was the most important thing to her. Why? Because she's a child of God. She knows her identity. She knows uh, what her ultimate purpose here on this earth is. It is to lift up Jesus Christ. It is to help others uh, find out who he is. You know, I was, think- I was thinking about um, how-, how we get lost in this question. We just get lost in the idea of who am I, you know, what, what is my purpose here? We, th- those are the two big questions, identity and purpose. They go hand in hand. They, they both really talk about the same thing. And I'm thinking about the, sto- <laughs> the story of the lost sheep in, in uh, I think it's Luke chapter 15. For however many years of our life, we're walking around with a whole bunch of other sheep. Okay, we are just going with the flow of society. We are doing what other people tell us to do. We, we, we go to college because that's how you get a job. You get a job and you work and you start a family and you do all these things because this is what all the sheep are doing and they're all moving in a particular direction. But when you stop to think about what it is that you're doing, that's, I think that's when the sheep goes and gets lost. 
that's when the sheep starts looking for something else. And, and the whole time, you know, this is not in the story. I'm totally just like bringing in some creativity here. The entire time you're following the rest of the sheep, I guarantee you it is not Jesus Christ leading you. I guarantee you in John chapter 10, it's a hireling. It's another shepherd who is just guiding you along. It's a, it's a manifestation of the devil and his, his guiles, and he's pushing you in a certain direction. And then when you get lost, the true shepherd is the one who comes and finds you. The true shepherd is the one who cements you with his identity. He says, you have no need to fear. You have no need to worry. I will be with you always, even unto the end, he says to his disciples. I will be with you even unto the end. You have power. You have all of this uh, potential inside of you that when you believe in me, when you allow me to pick you up and throw you over my shoulders, like I will take care of you. I don't know. I just just no, something that popped into my head thought. that that's yeah. a great thought. Well, I think it goes along with the fact that you don't want what you do to become your identity. You also can't afford to allow others to tell you who you are. Mm-hmm. The other sheep, <laughs> sure, uh, because everybody else is doing this, and this is the way you're supposed to live your life. And as you said, you get out of high school, you've got to get a college education. And believe me, we're not saying that there's anything wrong with that. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's great if God leads you, especially if God leads you. But then you get a home, and then you have a family, and then you're successful. But the bottom line is, after you get all that, you still die. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have an identity in Christ, um, then what is it that you really have to look forward to in terms of your future? So you can't allow others to give you that identity, and you cannot afford to allow this world or this culture to give you your identity. Yeah. Because if you do, it could be the, the the results of that could be disastrous. Now don't misunderstand me. It could be that you live a good life. Sure. Successful. Yep. From the world's perspective. Everything goes right. Exactly. <laughs> but is that the will of God for your life? Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about it. Let's go back to our phones, Lake Worth, Florida, Sarah is joining us live in the Grace Hour. Sarah, welcome. Hi, Sarah. Hello, Pastor Love. How are you? Oh, not too bad, thank you. But I'm so glad to hear your voice <laughs> after so many years. Well, it's good to hear from you. <laughs> I thank for the Word of God today. And I'm, I'm not out together, you know, yet. But I thank God for, for for the word that you you and your other brother just speak, and I'm hoping by the grace of God that I'll get better. And I'm so glad to hear still how God is good, and His blessings still continue. Amen. His blessings still continue, and I'm trusting Him. And I'm thankful for the word that you and the other brothers spoke today. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. How can we pray for you? Oh, yeah. Pray for my health. All right, we'll do that right now with our listeners across the world. Father, we pray for this precious saint, Sarah, and you know uh, what she needs better than we do. And we pray that your healing grace would reach her today and restore her, Lord, to good health. We thank you that her heart is after you, and her heart is healthy spiritually, and we pray that just like her soul prospers, that you would prosper her physically and in every other sense of the word. And we thank you so much for her life of faith and her fellowship in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank Thank you. Sarah, great to hear from you. Great to hear from you, too. Don't and be a stranger and keep reaching out to us. Yes, and the other brother, too, I was blessed. Amen. It was a Thank good you, word, Sarah. wasn't it? Yes. Pastor Love, this is Amanda, Sarah's daughter. We're actually originally from the Brooklyn Ministry, originally under Pastor Moses, and now Pastor Stolen Johnson. Wonderful. Praise yes. God. Yeah, we, we, we were the family that used to cook with the Brooklyn um, booth. With my mom's famous for her oxtail. Ah, yes, wow. of course. Yes. Yeah. So now, she just wanted to reach out and have you guys 
pray with her as she continues to recover from her uh, her experience with COVID. God has pre- preserved her for o- almost three years now. She's getting ready to turn 86 years old. Oh, my gosh. Well, God bless her. We're so grateful that she reached out to us. Now, are you in uh, close proximity to Pastor Daryl Moses while you're down there? Uh, yes. We, we're, we're about an hour away from him. Okay. Well, that's that's good to hear, and we understand that he's talked about starting a ministry down there. Yes, yes. We thank God for him. We've um, visited their home fellowship, and we plan to um, participate with them when they do launch come in August. Oh, that's amazing. Well, thank you so much for reaching out to us. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your prayers for my mom. You're most welcome. God bless. 800-338-7060 is toll-free. Locally, it's 410 483 Zero, zero. Pastor Duke, um, we're going to take your call, and then we're going to continue our discussion right here in the studio. Welcome. Hi, Pastor Love. What a great program today, um, and God's been hearing our prayers. I was so blessed by um, Suzette's call that uh, at Bayview, I'm still at Hopkins, and I'm calling for if anybody excuse me, if anyone is in the area and I've run out of gospel tracks and I'm asking if anybody is able to come from there uh, through the Grace Hour maybe to bring me some more tracks so I can give out more tracks while I'm here in the hospital. We, We will make sure that you get some more gospel tracks. Count on it. Yes, my wife, unfortunately, can't be here until Wednesday this week to bring me more. And I said, oh, I don't want to be without them for a few days. So if anybody's listening, I'm at John Hopkins. I'm at Osler, the Osler building, room three. I'm sorry, Osler three, room 21. All right, Pastor, we got you. We'll make sure you get some gospel tracts as soon as possible. Please pray for um, Julia, Elizabeth, and Crystal, who I'm talking to today, please. All right. Well, Father, Thank you, Pastor Love. Father, we pray for these individuals, Julia, Elizabeth, Crystal. Uh, we know that Pastor Duke, although hospitalized, continues to continue his ministry as pastor, uh, reaching out to those that are there in the hospital, whether they're patients or employees. We just pray that you would use him greatly um, in his weakness. May your strength be perfected, and may your glory come forth. So we pray for them, whatever their needs may be, reach them with your great love and mercy today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Pastor Matt, this whole business of identity and how the devil seems to work overtime in the hopes that he could create an identity crisis in people's lives. Um, An identity crisis is where people struggle with that conscious sense of individual uniqueness. You might hear them say, I just, you know, I've kind of gotten lost in life. I just Mm. lost my way. I don't know who I am. I, I mean, we've all heard you know, the whole idea behind the, an individual um, having a, a midlife crisis. In other words, these are people that reach the middle of their lives. They stop, they take stock, they evaluate, and they can get lost. Mm-hmm. They can walk away from a marriage. They can walk away from a family. They can walk away from a career because <laughs> even though they might be successful in all of those realms and more, they just don't know who they are. Yeah. Yeah. It- it's so easy. Uh, let's see. There's the parable of the seeds in, uh, I want to say, <laughs> Matthew chapter eight, possibly, or maybe it's Luke chapter eight. And you have you have one of the seeds that gets planted in pretty decent ground, but then, as the same time as the seed as the plant is growing, as what Christ is doing in your life is is starting to flourish. Uh, the cares of this world is the way the Bible puts it. The cares of this world start to come up as thorns and wrap themselves around you 
And all of a sudden, you're just kind of like focused on the thorns and you don't see the fruit of what God is doing in your life. And when you don't see it, you start to doubt it. Uh, but 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 says, we walk by faith, not by sight. Uh, though though we can see the thorns, though we might feel them jabbing in on us a little bit, I, I, I just can't get over the fact that all these people calling in are calling in <clears throat> not in great health, uh, having gone through something traumatic or, or, or something that, you know, could be like, you know, death could be on their minds. And I can't get over the fact that all of them are talking about God right now. All of them are focused on their identity in Christ. That is their like bolstering point. There is nothing that's moving them from that. You know what other people would be doing who get, who get lost, who, who allow the devil to come in and, and play his mind games. He, he can come in as an angel of light and deceive us. He can come in and say, hey, this is a good thing. Go after that. And it has nothing to do with God. You know what most people are doing when they're in those situations that these callers are in? They're, they're, worried, they're worried about the possibility of death. They're worried about <clears throat> you know, what they could have done or should have done with their lives. And these people are so secure in what their life has been about, <clears throat> excuse me, that all they're worried about is, is Christ. All they're, all they're talking about is the kingdom of God. Uh, who, you know what it says in Isaiah? I want to say it's Isaiah 14. Is that where the I wills are of, mm-hmm. of the devil? This is the coolest thing I ever heard preached from Pastor Donald Valerio. Uh, it says, at, after the, all the I wills, after all these big things that the devil says he's going to do, it says in verse 15, yet you shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see you shall narrowly look upon you and consider you saying, is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, destroyed the cities thereof, uh, that opened not the house of the prisoners? Like, is this little serpent lying on the ground, this thing? For all we know, the, the, the devil is as big as a garter snake. For all we know, that's all he is. Is this the one who we're going to let uh, dictate who we are and what we do and how we live our lives? Or are we going to look at him correctly with the eyes of God and realize that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, because we are of the seed of Christ, we are of the seed of redemption, we can crush the devil with, with God's thoughts on our identity and not our own and not what we allow to seep in. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, that he blinds our understanding. But whenever we're living in our identity with Christ, uh, he, he enlightens our eyes. And we have a whole different perspective that we're looking at things from. Amazing. Um, and I think that that's, that's the problem with sin, when it happens, when it's brought into our lives. Um, because you could, you could almost present the question this way, what does sin do? Well, it gets us to doubt who God says we are. Mm-hmm. And the devil is right there, ready to whisper in our heart's <laughs> yep. uh, mind and say, you know, if you were who you claim to be, would you have done that? Mm-hmm. If you were a Christian, would you still be struggling with this particular habit? This has been a part of your life since, well, since you supposedly accepted Christ. Mm-hmm. Maybe you're not a Christian. And I think that what does that do but create that crisis in our souls. I, I think he even attempted to do that with Christ. Mm-hmm. I mean, I really do. Yeah. But isn't that what the nature of the temptation in Matthew 4, Luke chapter 4, was all about? If you are who that voice said you are, prove it. Mm-hmm. If you're the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. And again, Jesus didn't have to prove anything. No. Yeah. He was who God said he was. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And I think that what happens is the devil comes in, he whispers and says, you know, if you really, and then he says, you know, if you think you are, prove it. Yeah. And then we start to get busy. Oh man. And we start working. (laughs) And then we find ourselves in that category of those that are just worn out, heavy laden, burdened, because why? Because we're trying to prove what God says. We don't have to prove, but simply have to accept as a declaration that comes from him. Yeah, there's a, there's a story in the Old Testament, Zechariah uh, uh, chapter 3, 
Joshua the high priest, okay? He's the high priest. He is the one that goes before the presence of God for all the people of the camp, all the people of Israel. And you know what the devil's doing right next to him? He's saying, hey, your garments are dirty. You don't deserve this position. You're a sinner. You can't enter in here, right? This is, this is what the devil does to all of us. Uh, it, it doesn't matter what the devil says. You know what matters in the story, Zechariah chapter 3? It's, it's what Christ says, verse 4. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused your iniquity to pass from you, and I will clothe you with a change of raiment. You are a whole new person. You have sin in your life. It affects you. It brings you down. You are a whole new person in Jesus Christ. Romans 8, verse 1 again. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, those who are called according to his purpose. No matter what the devil is whispering to you, your identity is forgiven, your sins are forgotten. As far as the east is from the west, they have been separated from you in Psalm 103. This is who Christ is. This is what he does for us. This is who we believe in so that we can see that clearly. So that when he gives us a verse out of his word, we can say, yes, Lord, I believe that, not anything else that the enemy or other people are bringing to my doorstep. We should just saturate our souls with all of those references and promises in the Bible that uh, speak about our identity and build us up in our identity. Because I just think of 1 John chapter 3, the apostle writes and says, "Look, look at the manner of love that the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Now, the world doesn't know us because it doesn't know him. But I love the next verse. Beloved, right now, we're the sons of God. Amen. You know, the devil would love to say something different. Mm-hmm. Right now, you are anything but a child of God. But God says, no, right now, you are my child. But, some, you know, the devil would say, but, but they've sinned. It doesn't change <laughs> our status as sons. Yes. Any more than the prodigal could leave his father's house and then return after repenting and recognizing and confessing his sin and say, just make me a servant. The father said, that's ridiculous. Yeah. You're, a son. You're a son. You've always been a son. Amen. And you'll be restored back into that place of sonship once again. Great thoughts. Pastor Matt, thanks for joining us today. Friends, we're out of time, uh, but it's a great subject that we have and we're going to be developing throughout this week. And we appreciate those of you that weighed in and shared your thoughts on Uh, Again, gracehour.org, YouTube Live, Facebook Live. Marty, we didn't have time to take your call, but we hope you'll make it tomorrow because we'll continue this theme and continue to develop it throughout the week. Again, friends, appreciate you joining us. We'll be back in a little less than 24 hours from now, and we hope you'll join us for the Tuesday edition of the Grace Hour. Until then, may God bless you.